thank you for the introduction. So uh, hi, um, I will get right into it. So um, yeah, I'm interested in hereditary cancer syndromes um, and more recently experimenting with long read sequencing for exploring structural variation. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the personalized oncogenomics program, which is a large study at the BC Cancer, uh, where patients with advanced cancer and or um, rare cancers and have very little therapeutic options are enrolled for multi-omics study to uh, try to identify some clinically actionable features, and that can be either at the level of the treatment or, in my case, uh, as well as he uh, hereditary cancer syndrome, which has implications for the rest of the family. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, the cohort is still growing. It's an open uh, clinical trial. Uh, we're, I think, around 750 patients, most of which are adults. So those are some of the uh, POG analysis. Uh, it's very comprehensive. So patients have tumor match normal, whole genome sequencing, as well as uh, tumor whole transcriptome sequencing. In the blood, so the normal DNA, we only analyze 98 known and validated hereditary cancer predisposition, and we mainly use it to subtract it from the somatic genome to identify the somatic events, but I will talk mainly about hereditary cancer here. So there's an interface between the research and the clinical world, uh, specifically in this study, and one aspect is uh, at the level of these 98 cancer predisposition genes. Uh, when variants are detected uh, of moderate to high impact, then they're reviewed by the germline ethics committee to determine if they should passed to the clinical realm for validation and referral to the hereditary cancer program clinic. So at the moment, we're still uh, completing the review of the um, germline variants in our cohort, but we have completed 570 adult cases, and in these cases, we identified 70 pathogenic germline variants. Most of these, um, 59, were small mutations, but there were 11 structural variants, and we selected three of these uh, to undergo Minayan technical validation uh, with two flow cells for each case. And uh, we also took one structural variant of uncertain significance, and we uh, completed five flow cells on that structural variant that was very difficult to resolve. So I will talk to you about these four cases uh, in more details in the next few minutes. The reason why we selected these cases, it was because they were complex, they were involving repeat elements, we had some uncertainty around the breakpoints. The clinical phenotype did not match what we expected with the genotype. Uh, there were some that were recurrent uh, or that we couldn't fully resolve using only the Illumina sequencing data. So those are four examples that we selected because they were challenging and there was also potential clinical actionability related to these genomic findings. This is the table of our um, POG hereditary cancer structural variants. So the 11 uh, first cases were presumed pathogenic, and the last one was that uh, variant of uncertain significance that we wanted to explore. And I highlighted in blue the ones that underwent some Minayan sequencing. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, these four very interesting cases. Um, so those are a summary of our sequencing runs. I highlighted the patient 12, the last of these cases, uh, because we had difficulty to resolve it, and that's the reason why we completed four Minayan uh, flow cells. And we had uh, diminishing yields uh, regarding the, um, like, uh, the amount of data in the flow cells, but we're looking into it with uh, the Nanopore team um, at the moment to try to optimize the way we prepare and sequence. So the first patient is a patient who had an ATN deletion, which was detected on the Illumina data just based on the BAM ratio coverage. And uh, you can see we rearranged a little bit the IGV screenshot to help the visibility of the genomic features. I've put the gene model on the top, and uh, you have the blood DNA track, and then at the bottom, the tumor uh, DNA track. And you can see a very important dip of coverage where there is a large deletion of ATM. And uh, here I'm presenting uh, the nanopore sequencing data on top, as well as the Illumina sequencing data at the bottom. And uh, we found that one read, uh, 13 KB, that I highlighted in pink, that covered uh, this rearrangement. So for us, uh, another thing that we found was interesting is that the aligner in GMLR aligned properly the read, uh, but Minimap2 actually clipped the read, so it would not have detected uh, this as a deletion. Um, so that was one interesting feature. Um, we had performed long-range PCR with only, uh, you know, size product, and it was consistent with what we found. Um, 
what we liked about uh, using Nanopore is the fact that um, it did not require primary design. We are trying to test whole genome sequencing with Nanopore for assessment of any structural variation. So uh, that did work out. Um, and uh, also in our case, you know, it's more expensive to do long-range PCR compared to standard PCR, so um, it could be also an alternative as a test. Also, what we found was helpful is because the breakpoints are within six KB repeat elements, line elements, we couldn't know exactly how big that genomic space was. Um, we could assume with a non analytic a homologous recombination that there would be one line element left, but with having that read, it confirmed that aspect. So we're going to go in order of increasing complexity. Uh, this patient had a complex structural rearrangement that involved three genes, NTHL1 and TSC2, which are known involved in hereditary cancer, and another gene called TRAF7. On the left side, uh, you have the genomic area that involved NTHL1 and TSC2, and on the right side, you have the genomic area involving TRAF7. And if you pair the reads only simply, you would deduce that there are two inversions, and two deletions. So I simplified this graph, but I'm going to show you a different way to represent this data in a few. So uh, here, uh, this was of particular interest for us because tuberous sclerosis is a syndrome that is caused by TSC1 and TSC2 um, germline mutations. And the patient had tuberous sclerosis, but their tumor also featured very elevated signature 30, which is associated with biallelic germline NTHL1 uh, variants. So we assume that these events were biallelic. Um, this is uh, the nanopore sequencing data on top, and then again the Illumina data, data at the bottom. And we found a read that spanned both presumed TRAF7 breakpoints, therefore supporting that TRAF could not be disrupted on both allele. And while looking more closely at the data, we're uh, presenting now a preliminary novel data visualization. So uh, Martin K, best known for inventing the circus plot, uh, kindly gave us some advice on how to visualize complex structural variations. Um, and these are not to scale and still in working. Uh, we making them at the moment manually, but maybe perhaps eventually in an automated fashion. Um, so yeah, uh, at the moment, uh, at the top, you have the reference and uh, the genes, NTHL1, TSC2, TRAF7. And the way that you read this shoelace plot is that your eye follow the line. And if you happen to read a genomic segment from left to right, it's in its correct orientation. But if you read it from right to left, then it means it's inverted. And if it's not present, well, it's not present. <laughs> so at the bottom, you can see the biologic copy number. And so you can rapidly see that actually these complex events were simply two deletions with the middle segment being inverted and everything was happening on one allele. That's uh, another simplified way of visualizing this. So if you remove the areas that are deleted, I've just put some schematics of the nanopore sequencing reads at the bottom, the ones that were spanning the breakpoints. So in total, for these four breakpoints paired together, we had one long read on one of the breakpoints and three long reads on the other one. And the wild type TRAF7 reads was telling us that these events were actually happening on one allele and not two, uh, which we were biased uh, because of the signature 30. Uh, we also found that it reduced the manual analysis time when using long reads instead of trying to pair and make all the different combinations of which reads could have gone where uh, in which events happen in which order. The third patients, actually, this is a very interesting case for me because there were three patients that had the exact same large inversion called in their data. And this inversion invo involved IFT140 and TSC2, but none of the patient had a phenotype of tuberous sclerosis, which is a highly penetrant disorder. Uh, two of the tumors were not associated with this syndrome. One might have possibly uh, be associated. And you can see there's decent uh, support in the Illumina data. And when we did uh, select one of these patients to undergo some nanopore sequencing, it was really quickly obvious that what caused this false positive call was actually a 132 base pair inverted duplicated TSC2 intronic sequence that came and inserted itself in IFT140. And we had two of these reads covering this breakpoint. Uh, because one of the um, ALU elements is on the positive strand uh, in IFT140 and on the negative strand in TSC2, that's why. 
uh, it mapped it as an inversion. And the size of this um, small structural variant is about the size of an Illumina read, so that's why it was very well supported in the data and actually called by diverse structural variant tools such as Delhi and you know, uh, the other ones. So um, yeah, we found that it was quite quickly obvious when you use a long read that TSC2 was not disrupted. So it changed the classification of a variant that was pathogenic, if it was disrupted, to uh, a likely benign variant. And our cohort, this allele is quite frequent. It's one in 450. And now the last patient. So uh, this is a patient who had complex structural rearrangements involving three regions, two genes, UIMC1 and an SD1, as well as the middle uh, non-coding region. So I put at the bottom uh, simplified schematics of what uh, you would interpret based only on the Illumina paired reads. So again, two inversions and two duplicated area. So a little bit of mirror image of the patient four. Um, here, uh, I'm presenting the Illumina sequence data at the top, uh, I mean the nanopore sequencing data and then the Illumina sequencing data, and also uh, the Sniffles variant call, uh, which uh, also was able to locate this structural variant despite low coverage. And here are this shoelace plot again. So what is happening here is that at, at the top, you have the reference uh, sequence, and you have a large segment in the middle that is duplicated and inverted. But what was difficult to resolve initially is the fact that the 11 base pair of segment C is not duplicated because it is within the duplication, but it's shaved off at the area where it's inserted. But initially, it was hard for us to figure out why would it be in the duplication, but it would be only two copy when you look at the coverage. So we had to scratch our head quite hard to figure out that one. Here is the simplified schematics, again, with the nanopore reads that we identified. Um, so three on one side and four on the other side. Um, these tr the two breakpoints, initially we had a hypothesized more breakpoints, and again, a bilalic events, but uh, with the data uh, and looking at it more closely, we resolved these that the most simplistic explanation was indeed that this large segment was duplicated and inverted, and that these 11 base pairs were shaved off by non-homologous uh, joining on each side. So it went from uh, uncertain significance classification to a likely benign classification. Also of interest, uh, some of these uh, were expressed in the transcriptome because the genes were then becoming close to each other, UIMC and an SD1. So the data was very much easier to analyze using the long read because otherwise some of the reads were mapping in the middle and and other areas of the genome uh, using the short reads. So for me, uh, because I am mainly clinically trained, I'm looking into what could be the potential clinical utility of using sequencing, and especially for structural variation. So uh, in our small preliminary analysis of these four interesting cases, we uh, were able to identify the 12 breakpoints in these four complex structural variants. So for us, it was um, sort of a positive experiment, at least a pilot study. And in two of these four structural variants, the resolution uh, required long read sequencing, um, and especially for the false positive IFT140 TSC2 inversion, uh, I found that very helpful because this means that three patients don't need to have technical validation, don't need to have clinical validation of their clini the genomic findings, and they don't need to be referred to the hereditary cancer program because they do not have tuberous sclerosis. So the potential I see for long reads is the comprehensive assessment of all types of structural variants. And um, at the moment, uh, current clinical testing mainly focus on copy number assay. So for example, MLP and microarray, but uh, you wouldn't be able to identify an inversion, for example. So I'm hoping whole genome sequencing could be an all-in-one <coughs> test for all types of structural variation and also could resolve the precise breakpoints of these rearrangements. So for future directions, uh, we are looking forward to doing some more research with the new Promethion that is coming this summer. And uh, we got some funding uh, to do a pilot study uh, from the Macri Hereditary Male Breast Cancer Fund. So we will uh, study the four genes associated with male breast cancer. So BRC1 and 2, CHECK2 and PALB2. We will select some cases uh, from the Hereditary Cancer Program uh, Clinic database and use Nanopore to validate the breakpoints of these known structural variants. 
And uh, we have a specific interest because we identify that maybe perhaps two-thirds of all structural variants may be founder variants, which has been described in certain populations, such as the BRCA variants in the Spanish population, and we want to explore that more, because we wonder could uh, germline founder SV be amenable to a panel approach, because we know that they may contribute the majority of disruptive structural variation in hereditary cancer. Also, another interest of our center is uh, the clinically actionable somatic gene fusion that we would like to explore further. I just want to acknowledge the POG team. So as you can see, a lot of people are involved in this project, and uh, it's very multidisciplinary. So the clinical, as well as the lab, and the bioinformatics is very integrated in our team. Um, and of course, the patient and families, my supervisor, Steve Jones, here present, and Kasmin Sandschrader, and some of our close collaborators. And finally, uh, thank you to the Nanopore team and London Calling team for having me. So thank you. <laughs>